Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, this is another in Abel Cine's series of Creative Forces uh, Conversations with Filmmakers. Uh, my name is Jeff Smith. Um, our guest today is Jessica Dimmock, um, who I'll introduce in a moment. I also wanted to let folks know that um, kind of behind the scenes, we have uh, Abel Cine's uh, Technology and Education Development Manager, Megan Donnelly, who will be fielding uh, questions uh, in the chat and uh, surfacing them to Jessica uh, at appropriate times. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. And I would like to introduce our guest, Jessica Dimmick. Jessica Dimmick is a New York-based photographer and filmmaker. Her first body of work, The Ninth Floor, won numerous international awards, including the Inga Morath Award from Magnum, the F Award from Fabrica and Forma, and the Juror's Choice Award from the Center in Santa Fe. Other photographic and film work has earned her three World Press Photo Awards, the Infinity Award from the International Center of Photography, the Kodak Award for Best Cinematography, and most recently, a Guggenheim Fellowship for Film and Video. She's been a member of the Photo Agency 7 for more than 10 years. Jessica has been included in film, film, Filmmaker Magazine's uh, 25 New Faces of Independent Film, and as a fellow of the Sundance Documentary Fund. She's the co-director of the critically acclaimed Netflix documentary series, Flint Town, which was nominated for a Critics' Choice Award, an IDA Award, and a Cinema Eye Honors Award. She is the co-director of The Gallagher Effect, which won an Emmy, uh, and directed on the reboot of Unsolved Mysteries for Netflix, She's currently working on a series for Hulu. Before her work as a visual storyteller, Jessica worked as a public school teacher uh, here in Brooklyn. Uh, welcome, very. Thank you for joining us. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you. Um, we're so happy to have you. And um, I know that you know we've uh, we've had Abel Cine has had a relationship with you for a, a while now, um, but this is a great opportunity, I think, to kind of share uh, some of the work that you've done and some of the tools and techniques that you've. Uh, used or even developed in, in many cases um, with our with our kind of larger audience. Sure. So I was thinking um, first, if you could just give us a little bit of uh, background on yourself as a you know as a visual storyteller in in the medium of still and and motion photography. Sure. Um, so yeah, my my background is as a photographer, um, and I still very much consider myself to be a photographer, although it's probably only about 20% of the work that I do right now. Um, but I, I kind of approached filmmaking through, through that pipeline and I think about filmmaking very much in that way. So, you know, I'm always thinking about image first, um, but I'm also thinking about kind of the emotional resonance of image and the way that we can kind of give our audiences clues um, as to, the emotional landscape of, of a certain topic. And in a lot of ways, I, I like the training of photography and the background of photographer being that because in photography, you don't have these other tools. You have to lead with that entirely. And so you don't have the ability to use music or interesting editing or mm. hear people's voices or any of those things. So I very much come to filmmaking and directing, trying to kind of bring that toolkit with me. Um, that's great. Yeah, and I I first became aware of you um, with your body of work uh, of still photography called The Ninth Floor, um, which I think we have a few uh, selections from that we can sort of play, uh, people can take a look at. And if you could tell us kind of, you know, what, what this body of work is about and, sure. and where, where it was uh, captured. Sure. So the, the ninth floor, I began uh, as a student. I was studying at the International Center of Photography, and I um, came upon a group of individuals that were living in the Flatiron District of New York City uh, in this really nice apartment. They were um, they were all kind of tenants, or so to speak, of an old man named Joe Smith. Um, who was in his 60s and was an addict himself and had fallen on some hard times and allowed his dealer to move in with him. And with that dealer came friends and the girlfriend. And, and so by the time I met this group of people, um, 
there were like 15 people living in this apartment at one time. And there was a lot of chaos, but also a lot of raw kind of human emotion. And, and so I spent like a, a year with them photographing in that place and really trying to get at what it felt like to be there um, and what it felt like to look at addiction kind of through this interpersonal lens and also through a lens of like all of these people being on top of each other, uh, right. it's, but also still very, very isolated. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I was really struck by that, by like how people could be cohabitating on, in such close quarters, but also be so cut off from each other, so afraid, um, in so much pain. This this image that you have on the screen now is kind of like a total embodiment of that. This was a, a couple, Jesse and Mike, um, and Jesse becomes someone that I follow for years. Um, mm -hmm. Project kind of follows her for the next several years, but I remember kind of looking at this couple and the way that they were sleeping in bed and how <laughs> they really like couldn't have been at further corner right. bed if they possibly tried and it it said so much about the situation they were they were all in and 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 how much they were struggling and so yeah so I um I, phot I photographed this project for several years and and followed as people dealt with their addiction and some came out and, and some relapsed and and some had you know moments of hope and then falling back into it and there was a couple that stayed together after they were all kicked out and had a baby and you know I just kind of wanted to just stay with it as long as possible um and so yeah it's it's very the, powerful thank you it, no, I mean I, they were really they were really incredible people to work with that you know I grew to love <laughs> a lot and 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 were really very very open and and great with me um in letting me kind of see what daily life was like and and what it was like to be there right and it's a very different now i imagine you know in that part of uh, of manhattan or new york city uh being kind of so yeah yeah luxury so, apartments and rent, high rents and yeah sports. So they lived in this beautiful, they lived right off of Fifth Avenue on 22nd Street, and they lived in this beautiful building. Um, the the Joe, the man that occupied the apartment and had allowed them to come in, had lived there for a long time. So he was rent stabilized, and, and he had come from a lot of wealth, um, and he had just not been able to maintain it. But, you know, it was, I know that now there's like a, Twelve thousand or fourteen thousand dollar a month rent there, and uh, at one point, I mean, I don't know if it's still the same tenants, but a few years after this group was kicked out, I, I met the people that lived there, and it was like a designer from Calvin Klein, and right. so you know. But to me, like the idea that these two worlds could exist on top of each other um, and have so little interaction with each other, the idea that like all of this was happening. Um, just on the ninth floor of this building where, right. you, you know, above and below were, were so wealthy and so affluent. Um, right. Like right by to me. Madison Square Park and yeah, Back and yeah. You know, stuff. Exactly. Yeah. That's very, yeah, it's, I, this work has really stayed with me, I have to say, and I, and I, I revisit it uh, often. So did, was there a genesis of uh, potentially for subjects like this or for just your work in general? Like when, at what point did you start thinking like, you know, I want to bring some of those other tools, editing, sound, uh, you know, motion, uh, cinema into, into the kind of work that I'm interested in doing? It's a really good question. You know, I, I like, I definitely never, I never thought that I was going, I, I very much thought that I was going to be a photographer and I never thought that I would be a director or a filmmaker um, in part because it seemed like that what like the, the, the entry gate to that just seemed like this whole other thing. It seemed like a whole other set of school, a whole other set of equipment and materials. Um, mm. And, but I always, but I thought 
about, you know, this still project and, and my photographic work, like I very much thought as films, I always thought of this, like I would describe this as stills from the movie of, of their life, you know, I, right. so, um, it, has that, it has a cinematic quality. Um, and I think, you know, as we, as we'll look at some, uh, short samples of some of your, you know, more recent work in, in, uh, in motion, that there's definitely like a commonality of vision that, that comes through from this work into the, into the more recent work. Thank you. I mean, I, I think what it, like, I think in a lot of ways, what it comes down to is that I did want to be a filmmaker and I didn't, I didn't know that. Um, mm -hmm. Because I, I remember craving to hear their voices. Um, when I made a book of this body of work, you know, I took Jesse's journal and I excerpted it and I, you know, did inner, like I, there were so many things that I just, I wasn't quite connecting the pieces and, mm. and I didn't realize, but, but deep down, I, I kind of wanted to be making films. I'm actually, I'm really glad I didn't know how to, cause I think it was, I, I, I like that this project is just photographic and I like what I learned from that, but I think I, wanted to do these, I wanted to bring in these other tools and I just didn't know yet that I could. Mm. That's really interesting. And so when you started to do that, um, you know, what, what were some of the tools that you, like, for instance, did you, it sounds like uh, the ninth floor was a kind of a mix of, of film and digital. So we, as a photographer, that, transition was happening during like the middle 2000s and yes. you were going through it along with the rest of us. Um, what uh, just could you talk just briefly sure. a little bit about like what what gear what type of gear you you use there and then when you when you kind of came into the motion realm what kind of seemed like natural tools to pick up? Yep so you know in my photography when I was shooting with film, I was shooting on a Leica. And if I was shooting digital, I was shooting with a, a Canon 10D and then that became a 20D and then that became the 5D. And then I you know, never planned on doing any motion work, but then the 5D came with a record button. And I like so many people like me was just like, oh, what does this do? <laughs> and, um, and that to me really kind of shifted a perspective, which is that like, I, like a lot of people, um, did know how to storytell, um, through video. And I, I just hadn't connected that, like what other people were doing in cinema was also what I was doing in photography mm -hmm. and that those things were connected and not separate. They, you know, sure they have different schools and, but there's so much common language between them. So, um, yeah, you know, all of a sudden there was a way to, to shoot video on, on my still camera. And then I found myself inclined to do that much more. And also it, starting to be inclined to see things as, as moments rather than, you know, fractions of a second, um, and enjoying the kind of thing that happens when you like, instead of condensing and pushing everything into like one perfect 160th of a second which is an amazing thing and is totally my first love but also like what happens when you allow it to go on for you know god forbid a whole second but like many <laughs> many many seconds um and so yeah that's like very much uh the the transformation of of how i was thinking about stuff that's great so when you when you you know found out that that your still camera could could make you know moving images as well and and started to you know explore that medium um, what 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 types of projects were you were you working on what was what was capturing your interest and what you wanted to share you know i I really like kind of you know big uh multi year like very invested, very embedded type of projects. And so I started to think about, you know, I am not the person that like cranks things out all of the time and I'm not the person that um, cranks things out always very quickly. And so I started to think about 
projects that I would have done as a photographer and spent a couple of years on, but that I could incorporate, you know, motion and voice and, and think about them more as films. Um, and so the first big project I did, um, once I had kind of gotten my sea legs and like, you know, got over a few of the technical obstacles, uh, that naturally come with like making a transition, the, the next project I did was, um, a documentary film called the Pearl, which again was like a three year follow, um, documentary and, you know, finding my, myself drawn to being able to just like live in people's experience and people's shoes for as long as possible and, and shooting it in a way to, to help the audience understand mm -hmm. as much as possible. That's great. Um, and I think we'll, we have a, um, a short segment or a trailer uh, from that, that we could take a quick look at. Um, and we were talking a little bit about it before the break and I, you know, I was trying to figure out, you know, maybe like when, when it, you had made it and what kind of camera you were shooting it on and you and you you offered up that it was a a, a Canon C100 which yeah. you know at the at the time was you know sort of seen as like the the kind of the the youngest sibling in the in the cinema EOS family um but i i had that camera too and i and i was often really amazed at how good the image quality was but i think however you were treating it and handling the footage, it's, it's on like kind of a whole other level. Um, it's a really, it's a, so it's a really good camera. I mean, it, we started, uh, I, I co-directed this film, um, <clears throat> another photographer turned filmmaker named Christopher Lamarca. And we, we both started it on DSLRs. Like we started it with, a, I think a, a 5D of some form, like one of the marks, but a 5D. Mm. And then we, um, you know, once we had like a little bit of money, then the first thing we did was invest in a C100, which was the the least expensive of that line, but it was a big jump up from, from the DSLR world. And I think we, you know, we were so excited by this like sensor and this camera that was very, easy to take on the road and very easy to work with and we could be small and stripped down and, and kind of scrappy but like it it looked really good and I think we were really excited so we we pushed it as far as we could in including doing things like um converting files into ProRes right on the camera through an Atomos so that like not having any right. kind of internal compression to then be expanded later um but really kind of like maximizing what the sensor could do and and yeah so we had like our whole little system and you know I can very much in in the trailer kind of tell where the 5D stops and mm. C100 starts but you know they're both like they they do a lot especially compared to what else was out at the time and and how much money it would have cost me at the time to try to to match something like that. Right. It's really interesting. I, how, you know, like how comfortable did you feel with your, with your tools and your equipment at that time? Did you feel like really pretty solid or were you still kind of feeling out some of the aspects of, of working with that? I, I mentioned that because I wanted to also highlight um, a, a short uh, film that you, that you did called Everything Water Touches. Mm -hmm. which um, I don't know when in time that was versus uh, the Pearl, but um, that sounds like that was a way that you could kind of keep the the scope of filmmaking, you know, relatively uh, contained and have complete control over all the elements. Yeah. So the, the first question is like, you know, the comfort level. And I think a lot of people do this is that they like, they stay with, a certain kind of line of cameras because that that camera has a language and that language makes sense to you. And so um, there were some differences in the form, but like I, I felt like, you know, I could operate that completely blindfolded, totally in the dark. It, you know, it was like, it was so intuitive, which I really needed 
as a person that was coming to this from a different discipline, I like, I needed to have that sense of confidence that I wasn't tripping up over my gear or getting frustrated or intimidated by my gear. And that it was just very, and you know, it was, it's a, it's a easy and, and simple camera, but also does, it did what I needed it to do and did that really nicely. Um, and then, you know, moving forward, also trying to think about at times, like how to, how to simplify that workflow. And so there are times that, um, I, that I think about kind of stripping things down into the most basic elements. Um, so this film that you're referencing, Everything Water Touches, was a film that I made with my partner, Zach Canapari. It was during the Flint water crisis. We were living in Flint mm -hmm. at the time, working on um, our Netflix series, Flint Town, and the Flint water crisis was also going on at the time. And um, it was so, it was being so covered in the media. It was being so covered in international news, which was incredible. Um, but there was like this emotional thing that we felt from just living in Flint and, and, and being around water all the time and the kind of paranoia that seeks it seeps in. And so we wanted to make like a horror film about water. And mm -hmm. so that, you know, was like, in a lot of ways was very, very simple. And we like thought about details and we thought about things that we could shoot easily and we didn't need a huge crew for and a way to like kind of make something, um, you know, do fewer things, but do them well. Mm -hmm. um, so we shot a lot of this in our Holiday Inn Express hotel room, <laughs> and in the Holiday Inn Express laundry room and things like that. But it, you know, <clears throat> was also a good reminder of like not needing all of the stuff and all of the all of the like tricks and the fancy things but just being right. kind of basic to get something across nice that's very interesting um i think we have uh you know a couple of minutes of of that project to take a to take a look at so why don't we uh why don't we roll that when uh, when we can get it queued up sure They got a sign over the water fountain saying, drink at your own risk. My nephew started getting tiny bumps and uh, red little rashes on his body. And the principal kept saying, don't wash your hands if you have a cut. We thought he had cradle cap because, like, you know, his hair kept falling out. They kept taking him back to the doctor, and they couldn't say what was wrong. Months and months, we've been drinking his water, and we had no idea what we was drinking. You can't really get around it. When I wake up, I got to brush my teeth, taking a bath, washing your hands, washing dishes. 
I always give my, my daughter and my son the water. My mom used to make chicken noodle soup with water. Watering your plants, washing clothes, taking a shower. Cooking with it. Wash your hands with it. My girlfriend was pregnant, you know, she was drinking the water. Are those ice cubes from the water? Boiling macaroni in it. Making coffee. Rinsing off your fruit, vegetables, meat. Did you wash that lettuce in Flint water? Wash my hands. I wash my face. Every single day, that's something we use. Every single day. You know how hard it was for us to retrain our children that they can't turn on a faucet? When we see all over the TV about our toxic water in our hometown, it does something to you. It makes you fearful. What are they going to do to us next? I don't trust nothing. I really don't. I don't trust them. I don't trust, no, I don't. I don't, I don't, because we people, and they're not treating us like we people. How can I fight this? He was the Wow. Really interesting. Um, I think, uh, you know, unless there's something, uh, any more information that you would like to give on on that project, um, which was a short film called Everything Water Touches. Uh, I think we have one or two, or at least one uh, question from the audience. Uh, Megan, do you do you have anything to uh, bring up to Jessica? Yeah, absolutely. Jessica, we have a great question that came in asking about the difference in how you might think about composing a shot, if there is a difference when you're working in still images versus moving images? Um, yeah, I, I, I do and I don't. Um, and, you know, I think, I think about composition often in a kind of similar way, regardless of which one it is. It's like, you know, I think everyone has kind of like the way that they see the world or the kind of filter that they see the world through and they kind of, stick to that. Um, but I do, and I was starting to say this a little bit earlier, but didn't really expand on it. But I, I do think that there's something about, you know, I think of photography as so tight. Like I, I always think of this analogy of like it being in a vice um, where you want as many layers, as much information, as much like beauty, all of that, like just pressed in, in these four corners as possible, because you've got one moment and it happens and then it's done and that's it. And you can only show one thing. Um, and I think about in video in filmmaking, really like expanding, expanding those corners out and like allowing it to breathe and, and really not starting from that place of like perfection or a, as like many tens in the score, in the score keeping as possible. Like, I think it's really important to, to start from kind of a lesser place and to anticipate the, the way things will all come together and kind of be at their most vibrant at certain moments and then also fade away. So I think of it much more as like a, a pyramid where you, you like want to ramp up and then also ramp down. And, mm -hmm. and so I, I do think about you know, the composition similarly, but I think about the moments very differently. I think it's like, I really um, have 
come to understand how important that imperfection of video work is in a way that like is not is not as valued in photography nor nor should it be there's not really space for it um but when you have the time you you kind of need to bring the audience through that transition i think that's yeah that's really interesting jessica there's another one that i think kind of goes along with this that you kind of touched on but just if you could elaborate elaborate do you think in general photographers already have a baseline aesthetic that could make them a good filmmaker yes <laughs> <laughs> the very quick answer is yes the like more complicated answer is um yes because uh you know i think that it also of course it somewhat depends on the type of photography i'm i come from a documentary photography background and so we are doing a lot of things and wearing a lot of hats that we just don't know that we're wearing like i photography is very much or documentary photography is a very lone wolf sport you are out in the field and you're producing by yourself you are making the relationships with the people that you work with and and kind of running those relationships you're not there to just take the image you're there to like get all of the access um you're thinking about composition and light so i you know i think that photographers are really and and also you're a director i mean i think um myself like a lot of photographers i know when i first started getting into film work i thought of myself much more as like a, a dp because i was in charge of the visuals and not you know in in these different disciplines the the vocabulary shifts around a little bit but photographers are really authors of their own work in the way that directors are as well and so you know, a photographer can think of themselves as a as a DP, they can also think about themselves as a director. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's a really natural transition for people that are interested in it. It's not a necessity, but I think for people that are curious about that, it's a very, it makes a lot of sense. I think there are a lot of things going on in the photographer's brain that happen in the filmmaker's brain. And Speaking of wearing a lot of hats, you know, I think there was, I think there was a question about sound specifically, um, that being like an element that is really kind of entirely outside of, you know, of image making, uh, especially coming from, from still photography, but how, how, what's that journey been like for you with capturing sound or do you often, do you try to work, I assume today you work with a, a dedicated sound recorder, uh, person, but. Can yeah. Talk about that. So, yeah, I'm of like you know I'm of I'm of several minds with this. One is that um, you know, sound is is ultimately so so important. And coming from a a visual background, I there were definitely times where I undervalued sound, and I'd be like, but it, this is so pretty, and like, <laughs> you know, it'll be fine that everything's peaking and and nothing's working. And like the reality is is that of course that's not true. And you will never see beautiful imagery with terrible sound in a film, but you will absolutely see, you know, really ugly imagery with very important sound because it like the river just only flows in one direction. And, and so had to learn very quickly to, to value that. And so I'm of a few minds, which is that like, A, I wanted to get my own head around it and I can absolutely run my own sound. And part of the reason that I shoot on the cameras that I do, the, the C100 line, so like the 100, then the C300, then now the C500, they're all kind of of the same family and they all treat sound very similarly. Mm -hmm. Um, it makes it very easy for me as a shooter and director to like get in there and, and, and work with it. And it's very intuitive. And so part of the reason I'm choosing the cameras that I'm choosing is because of the sound element. But I also think that like, you know, all of these are, are, this is a lot of hats and like, you know, I don't believe that directors and shooters should necessarily be editing their own material unless they have like a burning, burning desire to do so, um, because it's a whole different skill and it's a whole different job and it's a whole different mindset. And, and similarly with sounds, like I, you know, I think it's also, it's great that I can do it and that I 
if I'm afraid about bringing other people in because of intimacy or a certain situation, I can do it. But also I'm really happy to hand that off um, and have someone else thinking about that so that I can focus more on the things that I do need to be thinking about, especially when you're running several mics at a time, especially when you've got scenes with many people, you know, you can only <laughs> monitor X. So, you know, I really kind of believe in, in both and, and believe that everyone should do kind of whatever works for the project. Um, and, you know, sometimes the intimacy thing, uh, you know, that I mentioned, like some, at times I would be afraid about bringing in an extra body into a room, but also realizing that like, there's no reason that um, someone who's running sound can't be in a hallway or right outside of a door. And that, you know, if that's, if that's the thing that's going to get me the quality that I need, um, then that's worth it. You know, and it's not, it's not always about the dialogue. Of course, like the dialogue is so important. Um, but it's also about the little things that happened and happen in sound all the time that are also like these emotional indicators. So the way that someone like slams the car door or they come into their home and they put their bags down and they let out a sigh, you know, that has nothing to do with dialogue, but it absolutely indicates to the audience how they should feel and how that character is feeling in a way that that visuals might not be able to achieve. And so, you know, I always want to think about if I, if I can capture all of that stuff appropriately myself, or if, you know, if the subtlety that I need is, is going to be just too much to handle. Yeah. It's like, it's a lot to expect, you know, just to keep track of, let alone to actually be kind of authoring the image and the sound like at the same time. But I think, you know, despite that, I mean, so when you were when you made the um, the short subject that we just watched a little bit of, uh, you were you were working on your Netflix series Flint Town, a documentary series about the town of Flint, Michigan. Um, what what kind of drew you? Are you do you have like family or friends from there, or what kind of drew you to that subject? Because it seems like you you kind of, you know, put in a lot of time and it was really interesting to you. Yeah. So my, my partner, Zach Canapari and his longtime film partner, Drake Cooper had, um, had been working in Flint for a couple of years. They made this really beautiful documentary about Clarissa Shields, the boxer, um, mm -hmm. called T-Rex. And they had been working in Flint for several years and Zach, um, had stayed on and, and continued to work in Flint because he was so interested by other Flint stories and also the kind of interconnectedness of them. And so um, he eventually got access to the police department um, and really, really kind of full access to the police department. And, and that's when I came on. And I came on, you know, less originally interest I mean Flint is a fascinating place but I didn't have a strong of a personal connection to Flint but I was really interested in what policing in America like what was going on kind of at the water cooler like what what was Flint has a very very high crime rate it's got um a very understaffed um or in a lot of ways like defunded department um and they kind of make it work um but it's also it's a system that's full of problems and and we had access to a very mixed department a lot of black officers from the community and a lot of white officers not from the community as there was you know a continuing crisis in america about policing um and it was to me a really interesting opportunity to look at you know how different officers felt about the job and felt about the community that they served. And, and Philando Castile's shooting happened um, during the course of, of that project and, and kind of being in the roll call room as these different officers really saw like very different realities. Um, and so that was really what drew me to that project. And then yeah, being able to just be 
so in, inside of it um, and, and kind of letting officers like s speak for themselves about what they think about these things, um, despite sometimes our like very, very different feelings about it. Um, so yeah. Interesting. And then, and then the crisis with uh, with their water supply kind of piled, yeah, on top of or in the middle of that as well. Yeah. And you know what we what we really found, and and, and I think that this is, of course, continues to be true and is really coming up, is that like you know the the relationship between the community and the police can't exist outside of these other relationships. So in a city where there's a tremendous amount of poverty, where there's been systemic racism, where they have been kind of left by industry and 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 um, like abandoned by capitalism and also the systems that should be in place that you expect to work don't. So like you can't necessarily trust the police um, to come to your Aid, there's there's a lot of problems in Flint about like police um, reaction times. Sometimes they're mm -hmm. so overburdened that sometimes a 911 call will not go answered for 24 hours. Um, so it's like you imagine as a citizen that it would be very, very hard to trust that that system was there to protect you. Um, at the same time, like when the water that comes out of your tap is poison, you also, that's another system that you cannot trust. When the schools have continued to close, that's another system that you can't trust. And so there's a real kind of failure. Um, there are a bunch of failures that are like in that city happening all at the same time. Right. That really kind of exact and, you know, all of them exacerbate each other. And it's, it's really, to me, when I, you know, I remember watching it when it was on, or I mean, it's still on, but when it, when it came out um, uh, and just being really struck by how it does seem like that that community really has been saddled with with so much but in some ways it's a it's a real microcosm of you know the larger america and what so many different urban and and non-urban um communities are are facing you know but yeah um, i mean flint is fascinating in that it had you know can go from the poster child for like american industry and having some of the highest median incomes in the 70s and 80s, you know, and like the average income, uh, the average household income being amongst the nation's highest to um, being at the lowest and, and having some of the harshest crime and, and y y all of the things that go along with that. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's, it's like all of the things that could go wrong happen at once. Well, why don't we um, take a look at a, um, a I think it's like a, a trailer for, for Flint Town uh, and get a feel for some of the imagery and then uh, we'll talk about that on the other side. Sure. The clip. Thank you. Flint is an average by a long shot. It's hard to step out of your own skin and realize that this isn't what everyone else is dealing with. I mean, every system has a breaking point and I don't know where ours is. Flint. It was a great place to grow up. The home of the middle class. And then things kind of changed. Then they changed quick. You're all right, OK? We are inundated by violence. There's just not enough of us. Poverty breeds crime. Then you throw in there a water crisis. How is there not civil unrest? Motherfucker. Police officers are problem solvers, but sometimes it seems as if the problems have no end. I don't think the police, the government, the politicians, they don't give a fuck about you no way. The current climate for police work is scary. It's intimidating. We're going to take our city back. Man, what the fuck, bro? We're going to take it back. How can you trust the police these days? How can you? I have a son. It makes me afraid for him to grow up. The thought went through my head, this guy's going to kill me. And then I just started shooting the gun. The urban police have the power 
to tear a city apart or help hold it together. We have to show people that we're human too, and this is more than just a job. Stupid motherfucker! Man behind your back! I feel lost right now. How can a city fall so far that we lose sight of the possibility of solutions? What's ailing this city could become an epidemic around the country. Great. Again, very p powerful is the word that I, I keep coming back to for a lot of your work and also insightful. But um, can you maybe talk about some of the dynamics, you know, that we've seen play out in other communities um, with respect to, you know, issues like race um, and the police um, with respect to this project? Sure. Yeah. You know, I think one of the, one of the things that's really stayed with me in this project is is the there's the role of of a community based officer versus like an out, outside officer and 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 so many of the dynamics that we're seeing right now um, in terms of the the kind of brutality that black and brown communities experience through policing and and our show follows um, a, the like the first year of a new chief when the city is having a tremendous crime problem, but also is having all of these other issues. And, and a new chief comes in with a very aggressive policy um, and a very kind of like zero tolerance approach to policing. And, and you know, what we aim to do is, is kind of look at whether or not that's the right thing to do. Uh, and it, whether it's the right thing to do to any community and, and certainly to this specific community that has had, um, so much hardship and has had so many underlying reasons for the the crime levels that they have and and whether or not this kind of like zero tolerance and and broken windows theories and all of this stuff that's often used to justify policing um, makes sense. And you know, and and I think some of the characters that we follow really believe that it does. And I think some of the characters that we follow, um, especially some of the black officers that are from the community are, are really having like a crisis of heart. Um, and it's, you know, it's been painful to see how, how much that continues on and, and how, how true that is for so much of this country. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, um, it's like a really profound crisis. Right. Um, it, I did find that the imagery though, like, even though it's, you know, it's very much a documentary, obviously nothing, nothing is, st is staged or anything like that, but really, and I think we have a question from the audience, uh, that relates to this, but in terms of like your style, like it's, it's very fluid and, and lyrical and very cinematic, um, uh, do I have the kind of basics of the question right, Megan? Yeah, abs absolutely. The, the question was if Jessica's style has changed, you know, throughout her career, and if so, why? Yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, the Flint Town was like the first bigger thing that I was ever fortunate enough to do. And it was really thrilling to be able to um, have more resources to put towards the storytelling, to be able to like do a lot of the things that I love to do, which is like, you know, be in the corner of someone's bedroom as they like brush their teeth or they go to bed, like all of the kind of like super intimate stuff that I am really drawn to, but then also be able to kind of zoom out and, and show much bigger kind of things at play. I mean, um, the ninth floor, the photographic work that we looked at at the beginning, it does a lot of the things that I like to do in terms of the intimacy, but does like very little zooming out. Jeff, you and I, before we were talking, like you were asking, 
where this was in part because you can't tell because I, I don't do enough of like making it abundantly clear that this is happening in one of the richest neighborhoods in New York City. Um, and in part because I, I didn't know to do that yet and also in part because like that's a hard thing to do simultaneously. But right. in Flint Town, we could, you know, bring out a, a drone while mm -hmm. things really happened and we could um, mount cameras to cars and let them drive away and, and have their own conversations and talk about everything from like their takes on the Rodney King beatings all these years ago to like, you know, erectile dysfunction medicine and, and both of those things play out. Like we just had so many more opportunities to expand and contract the scope and that was like, you know, that was very, that was very fun to do and to play with. Um, and uh, certainly I do think about trying to like bring in those, those different levels of, of scope more as I, as I like move through this stuff. Um, there's a part of Flint town where two officers that are involved with each other romantically go on vacation together they go to Mexico and um they like we give them a camcorder and they bring it with them and and we <laughs> that stuff too and like you know I really enjoy the opportunity to like to mix that close to the skin stuff with like the the slicker fancier stuff um and also the like more democratic stuff like we all of our interviews all happen in the same exact setting. Everyone is, you know, everyone, whether they're a community member or the chief of police or an officer, like everyone's in the same kind of backdrop setting. And and so those are also choices that we're kind of making um, along the way. And also like coming up with rules, uh, which was a big thing that we did on Flint Town, which is that like police work inherently is, it's hard, like, you know, it, it's a lot of sitting around, it's a lot of being in vehicles, and then all of a sudden something happens and you're like scrambling. Um, so we came up with kind of a, a set of rules for how we shot things inside the station and inside city hall and, and town hall meetings and things like that, um, and how we shot out in the streets um, mm. so that, you know, we could kind of, A, delineate and differentiate, but also, shoot things in a way that made most sense for those settings. Interesting. I, and I, I think we have a question related to, uh, to post-production, uh, but that made me think, you know, like, are you thinking about things like coverage and like, you know, different kinds of establishing shots or master shots and then, you know, uh, zooming in or, or covering action in different ways. But why don't we hear about that, that question, um, Megan? Yeah, the question was what your post-production process is like. You go into your projects having an idea of your main story and beats, or is there everything figured out more in the edit? Um, definitely go into it really kind of having an idea of what the story is and what the beats are. I mean, I remember my co-directors and I, so I co-directed Flint Town with Drake Cooper and Zach Canapari, and I remember before the edit started kind of mapping out generally note card style, like what we kind of thought our eight episode structure was. And it really, you know, it really kind of stayed to that. And not because we were being prescriptive with our editors and saying like, this is the thing you must <laughs> um, adhere to, but because I think we did have a sense of kind of where things landed and were supposed to, to live um and then finding the kind of language of it very much in in the edit or like the type of flow and the type of the type of experience um but but going into it knowing it for sh for sure right. and how did you sort of approach uh the the editing process did you have like editor creative collaborators who happen to be editors that you knew you wanted to work with or uh how did you sort of find that and were you involved like were you familiar with like the editing environment that they were using or 
Yeah, so we, um, editing the project took almost a year. Um, Dre Cooper, who's one of the co-directors, is also an editor. So that's also a really incredible, you know, thing to have on a project, which is that like so much of, so much of the language that we were developing as directors was also influenced by one of our directors being an editor. Um, and then, yeah, the other, the editors that we worked with were, were such a, you know, like such an important collaborative partnership. Um, Carter Gunn, Mark Harrison, like they're, they're just so, you know, and we were, we were there for all of it, except I had a, I had a baby <laughs> towards the end of it and, and like stepped away a little bit. Um, but, you know, we were really there for the whole, it's not like we went and shot and produced, the, produced and shot this thing and then kind of handed it over and, and stepped away. We were very much involved on a daily basis until, until it was over. Oh, that's interesting. Thank you for reminding me uh, that you are also a parent. Um, and I know um, you're a member of the Directors Guild of America, but there's uh, there's something that you've kind of spearheaded uh, related to both of those things uh, relatively recently. Do you want to talk about that for a, little, a few minutes? Sure. Um, yes. Yeah, so I am I am a DGA member. I not for very long. Um, I joined when I made Flint Town, and um, and then in the process of making Flint Town, my um, my directing partner Zach, who is also my romantic partner, he and I had a baby, and um, the the DGA doesn't give any kind of parental leave. They don't kind of, or make any allowances for parenthood. So I, you know, had just joined the DGA and I had been a member for a little bit. And then I, of course, had to take a little break um, from directing, especially documentary directing, which is so kind of like field driven and also is very kind of long timelines and all of these things. And I, um, because of that, I didn't make my yearly quota the year that I had my daughter and I lost my health insurance. And because my directing partner is also my, my child's father, like I was able to, to see how, even though we were similarly situated, how the impact of having a child really affected me in ways that it, it didn't for him. And I thought so much about women in the field of directing and, and the kind of known inequalities that have plagued the industry for so long and, and looked into whether or not there was any kind of parental leave at the DGA and there isn't. And that's crazy because there should be. And um, so, yeah, have been part of a campaign or, you know, launched a campaign with Free to Work, which is Alma Harrell's amazing organization, and then paid leave um, which is an organization, Paid Leave for the United States, which is an organization that advocates for parental leave and, and paid leave in the, in the US. And so we've kind of created this campaign to hold the DGA's feet to the fire and, and kind of demand that this changes, that people, mothers and fathers, um, all types of family structures, including adoptive of parents need the opportunity to like take a step away from their work and not be penalized for it. Um, so like as a female director, just starting out, it, I, I was very aware that I couldn't kind of keep up with um, what was expected of me and that what my male colleagues would have been able to achieve like without any disruption um, and then trying to make sure that that doesn't happen especially sorry now I'm on the rant but especially like I've never you know the year that you have a kid whether it's adopted or whether it's you know whether you're uh, the the birth parent like you've never you never go to a doctor more um and so the idea that I would lose my health insurance at a time where it was arguably the most important time to ever have it just to me seems so backwards um so yeah, so that's what we're we're fighting for. And I believe that we will win at some point. Wow. Uh, I know that, you know, the DGA to their credit has taken it very seriously and they have 
Um, nothing has been changed yet, but they have, have an exploratory committee um, addressing the issue with, you know, really incredible people on it, like Barry Jenkins and and Leslie Linker Gladder, and you know, they are they are very much looking into how to change this so that um, parents aren't put at a disadvantage for having families, because right. that's what ends up happening, and then all of these inequalities that we're pushing for are just on the same cycle. Right. Well, thank you for bringing that, you know, that situation to light. I'm, I definitely have heard about other, um, you know, sort of professional organizations where, you know, there's similar kind of constraints, you know, a certain number of hours per quarter or else, you know, your benefits are, you know, not really available to you. And I wonder, especially like over the past year, uh, what that's been like for you as well. Um, do you see that same sort of kind of mismatch maybe between, uh, you know, people who are parents and not, or people who are mothers versus fathers versus other types of, you know, uh, child care providers? Yeah. I mean, listen, like, you know, the, the, data strongly suggests that like when these types of things happen, when we all go into lockdown and quarantine and, and kids can't go to school and things like that, that that affects mothers the most. That is absolutely not to say that there aren't fathers that have been affected and that everyone who has a kid is not, you know, doing their damnedest, but women left the workforce in this year at much greater numbers. And we know that these types of loads and burdens tend to fall on mother's shoulders. Um, and that, you know, a, a policy that pushes for a more kind of inclusive look at parenting um, is inclusive, A, because it's, you know, the right thing to do, but also like, because it, it also really helps women, you know, like uh, advocating for, for fathers to have time at home when they've just had a child is good for fathers, but it's good for mothers <laughs> too. Like it means that the mom is not their home with a, with a child. And certainly in this past year, um, you know, I, I know that I have felt it. I know that so many of my colleagues have felt it. I mean, the, the burdens of, of how we take care of, directors that have families is is something that I think the industry really needs to contend with. And um and there are certainly people that are kind of pushing for that in small individual, not small, but like in, in individual projects. Um, there are directors that like implement a certain set hour workday, like regardless if if this normal studio model would be like 14 or 16 hours, there are directors that say, I know that people on my crew have families to get home to and I can't, you know, we have to make sure it's a 10 hour day and not a 14 or 16 hour. Um, but we need it to be kind of a more systemic thing. And, you know, of course this year, as we all have been forced inside has also just made me think about creating differently and thinking about projects that have archival elements, not that mm -hmm. I ever want to stop shooting and not that I ever want to stop going out and, and making things, but that I want to like think about projects that can be, you know, done more, like more of it happens at home or more of it happens in my zip code and less right. traveled, you know, less travel right. dependent and things like that. That's, uh, that's really interesting. And I know, I mean, would you would you say that the the project you did for the weekly um, about the about the Navy SEAL uh, yeah issues uh, that 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 particular unit had would would that be an example of that kind of more of an uh, something that involves a lot of assembly rather than a lot of like field work? Yes, totally. So uh, yeah, the project that you're talking about the 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 podcast the Daily from the New York Times. Um, then, you know, as a kind of a sister type of project launched the weekly, mm -hmm. which is the, the kind of TV version of it. Um, and, um, I had the opportunity to direct an episode of it called the Gallagher effect about the 
Navy SEAL Captain Eddie Gallagher, who was accused by his platoon of committing a war crime. And, you know, in that, we didn't have access to Eddie Gallagher. We also didn't have access to the Navy SEALs. Um, what we did have access to was Dave Phillips, the reporter from the New York Times, who was really had done like stellar reporting on this. And then we had all of these leaked deposition tapes of all of the Navy SEALs talking to um, investigators about what they had seen and witnessed in Iraq and Afghanistan. And, you know, I am someone that like obsessively wants to shoot my own stuff and um, like always wants direct contact with whomever I'm working with. And it was a really, it was a really interesting and awesome thing for me to think about directing in a different way and thinking about the real backbone of that episode being all of this leaked footage that we like couldn't change in any way, you know, like we couldn't change, we couldn't make the audio better. We couldn't, you know, um, or anything there are times that. that things like where the mics cut out, but, but working with that stuff and really relying on the, the kind of visceral quality that exists from these depositions and from these Navy SEALs, like coming into one interrogation room and just talking to their, um, to the interviewers and, and, and like leaning into that. Um, I think we have a, if you want, we have the trailer of it. If not, people. Yeah. Can, Let's but. take a look at that. Um. Which team are you assigned to right now? Team 7. You're still Team 7. I'm at SEAL Team 7. The Navy SEALs are probably the most elite commandos in the military. Why do you think you're here, first of all? What have you heard this is about? The prisoner issue? Yeah. Reporting on the SEALs is extremely tough. So I'll have you tell me everything you know first. Okay. Um, I'll, I brought my notes. Just because There's a culture of being a silent professional. You don't talk about what you do. I walked over there to check it out, and then somebody told me, it's like, hey, grab your med bag. Did you actually see it happen? Yeah, I saw it happen. In the summer of 2019, we get leaked a trove of Navy materials that includes thousands of documents, helmet cam footage, photos, text messages, and all these confidential interviews with the SEALs. Stuff that no one has ever seen before. I kind of like heard more rumors and stuff like that of Eddie like targeting civilians. I saw Eddie take a shot at probably a 12 year old kid. What was Eddie's, I know he's a chief, but what was his official position? I mean, he was the platoon chief. Okay. This massive leak gives us insight into a very secretive brotherhood of commandos that otherwise we would never get to see. The guy got crazier and crazier. Yeah, you can tell he was perfectly okay with killing anybody. I see Eddie laying over on with the knife. This is a case where some SEALs who are not supposed to take things outside the family turned in their own chief. The guy was toxic. We can't let this continue. It's awful. You know, there are these guys who believe in doing good and had the courage to act. It's just that things didn't turn out how they thought. There were civilians everywhere. We have a problem. He's a psychopath. Hey. Very interesting. I have not um, had a chance to see this yet, but I will definitely check it out. And congratulations on winning an Emmy for the oh, uh, project. That's really Thank great. You. Thank um, you. One thing I thought was really interesting is like, and was it, correct me if I'm wrong, was this could be related to like the quality of the footage that you had to work with, but you definitely looked, it looked like there were some shots where you were playing some of that, um, you know, leaked uh, deposition material on a display and then photographing the display as it was playing. Yes. It's an so, interesting technique. Yeah, so there's, so there's mo you know, a lot of it were like, we've ingested this uh, leaked, all of these leaked videos that we have, um, and we ingest those in and we're using them in the edit. And then there are other times where exactly what you're seeing, it's, it's not a punch in, it's that we have played that video on a monitor and then we are filming with our cameras to do this. And like, 
you know, I think about that for in, in, in two ways. One is that we are limited in our material. And so like we have these, like I said, we can't change anything. We can't art directed or, and you know, it's like, it is what it is. And you have to kind of keep things going and, and, and keep it visually engaging and interesting, which is what I love that's been happening more and more in documentaries this past 10 years or so. Like as, as the cameras get better and less expensive and less um, restrictive in who gets to hold them and who doesn't, like the <laughs> visual language of cinema is just like in documentaries all of the time. And some of that is about, you know, coverage and shots and counter shots and all of this stuff because like it's, it looks good and it's engaging to watch material like that. And mm -hmm. um, so we're doing that for that reason so that we're not just like looking at the same thing over and over again. I'm also really into um, leaning into weaknesses. So I think like one of the things that I found myself craving as I would watch these videos is um, like the exact expression on someone's face. Like what is, what does a certain Navy SEAL look like when he says that the chief that he looked up to, he thinks is like an insane war monster, war criminal. And you kind of, you can't get that. Like this is grainy interrogation room, um, like police type footage. And so, you know, like what I loved was like leaning into that thing and not really being able to get it and to like live in this state of, of confusion and not total 100% um, information in the same way that like very much enshrouds this whole case, you know, that mm. like there are all of these Navy SEALs that are talking about what their chief did, but at the end of the day, there's not video of that moment and we weren't, we weren't there as the audience and you know, they, so it like, to me, it feels very emotional. I always like try to think about things that are emotionally accurate with the story. Mm -hmm. And to me, this type of like, you know, you can see it, but you can see it as well as the pixels will show right. you. And right. and I like the kind of like leaning into, to that feeling. Did you have any problem with flicker or did you need to address that? <sighs> Didn't really look like it. I don't think we did. We should have. Um, I don't remember us having difficulty with Flickr. We probably just like, you know, moved things around until we right. found the sweet spot. Um, uh, very effective though. Um, way to sort of make a, make a more, give it, give a shot, a more emotional point of view, even though, like you said, you can't really do anything to change it because it's, you know, sort of evidentiary footage. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I like, I, I think a lot of, I'm not alone, like a lot of people like that, that thing about like, you know, how do you treat evidence? Like, you know, you have this object and, and how can you think about how you look at the object and how you use it um, to evoke a certain type of feeling, even if that feeling is missing something or like not having you know, what, like wanting to lean in um, and wanting to kind of get closer. Very effective. Um, let's, uh, I think, you know, for the, we have about 10 or 15 minutes left um, in, our in our time, which has really just flown by. Uh, so thank you again for, oh. for, uh, for joining us and taking some time. Um, I was gonna ask Megan if there's any, any new questions that have come in. Yeah, absolutely. Jessica, people have been commenting on how creative the projects have been that you've shared. So yeah. thank you for sh for sharing all of those. And the question is, if you could talk about your approach on how you come up with the ideas of the shots, do you work with a team or, you know, how do the inspirations come to you? Um, that's a great, that's a great question. I mean, I, I really do mean this thing where, um, where I really like, I really do be believe in emotional accuracy. So like, I, I think it's great to do a thing if it, if it emotionally fits with the thing that you're doing. And that can be anything from like a super fancy drone to a really, really basic, um, like handheld kind of 
video portrait. Like I, to me, as long as it makes sense and feels emotionally consistent with the thing that you're trying to do. So, you know, using like a, a kind of big sweeping uh, drone shot on someone who's like alone in a field and, and struggling with isolation. Like, you know, to me, it always has to um, really feel like it makes sense for the storytelling that, that the kind of language of of cinema is this like additional layer that we get to put on everything that we do. And it, it has to be the right layer or the right like filter that clicks in that makes it all make a little bit more sense. Um, and it should never be distracting or gimmicky or confusing, you know? So there are things that like I've loved to do in one thing that do not make sense in something else. I, I um, before COVID hit, my partner and I were working on a project that used a lot of like ultra, you know, kind of super slow motion. So sometimes shot on the Canon C500 um, and sometimes shooting on phantoms if we wanted to slow things down even more. And, and I'm so interested in, in that for certain things and not, it's not like something that I now want to apply to anything I do. i I was like very interested in the way that we were using it um, in a specific setting. And so that's that to me is like the guiding force. Well, it doesn't seem like you're having any trouble staying creative, but are there um, are there things that you're doing to uh, to stay creative like during you know the the, well, the craziness of the last year? I mean, I I um I've been doing a lot of gardening. <laughs> um, I do a lot of, but I'm like, you know, I'm saying that in part, cause like it, to me, it is, I, to me, it like going outside and like pulling weeds and like ripping up soil and unearthing, like to me it is a way of like staying in a thought process rather than, you know, the doom scrolling and all of the other stuff <laughs> that I also am doing so much of. Um, and then collaboration, which I think is also one of the things that I love about filmmaking so much and that, you know, it was such a surprising, like such a nice surprise coming from photography, which is that photography is so solo and alone, which I, I really like because I'm very much a person that needs some of that. But like filmmaking is just so inherently collaborative. Like you're never... There is no, I mean, maybe if you're like some crazy, crazy, super specific director, but like there's no film that's made by one person making all of the decisions, one person making 100% of the choices. Um, and so, you know, a lot of that kind of keeping the creativity is like collaborating with other people that I think are so cool and I want to see how their brains would handle something. Right. Um, let's see what else, uh, for those who are starting out either who may also be, uh, have pursued another visual medium prior to becoming a filmmaker or who are just wanting to go directly into this sort of, uh, style of, of the highly, um, not stylized, but cinematic documentary that, you know, I think a lot of people associate with your work advice for the the younger or or newer filmmakers starting out yeah i just you know i think that like it's so i just think it's so great that the the like entry gate is more open than it's ever been i i s still think we have a very long way to come in terms of inclusivity and um representation but i I think more and more people feel that they can be the authors of stories and the author of their own stories or a story that they wish to tell. I mean, I don't think it's just about shooting one's own experience, but like at, that people can be authors and, and the, the barriers are less and less. Cameras are, are, 
kind of stronger and more um, technically advanced all the time. They, you know, the price comes down for the same type of thing, you know, like I just, I'm really inspired by that. And, and I think that I'm a big proponent of like, you learn how to do a thing by doing it and that you don't, you don't need to like pass some kind of course or credentials first to then go out in the world and do it. It's like you learn how to do it by doing it. And I, some of the stuff that I'm so inspired by is that like people go out there and break rules um, and change the, the, you know, I'm not a traditionalist. Like I think all of the cool stuff that happens in documentaries is by people that are pushing those boundaries um, and are, are pushing them because they think, fuck those boundaries. Sorry if I wasn't supposed to put string. Um, they think, screw them. And like, you know, why does that have to be the rule? And I think that that comes from, that comes from like, that comes from new blood. That's not a, that's not a, a traditionalist mentality. That's a like, come in and make stuff because it feels consistent with the voice that you have. And so I, you know, I think that stuff's really cool. I like all the, also, I like all the hybrid stuff. I like all the stuff that breaks rules of what a narrative film versus a mm. documentary film is and should be, you know, stuff that starts messing with those boundaries and those lines, I think is, is so great. And so thrilling, like so thrilling to watch. Yeah. I, I saw that trend in like, uh, kind of popular literature of this sort of the say. memoir written by the unreliable narrator or yeah. the person who's chosen to embellish their memoir into something like all out of proportion with what really happened. But then like that weird fusion of their desire to like, you know, uh, color outside the lines with the truth has actually resulted in something really interesting. Is that... Totally. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I wasn't even thinking about it in terms of literature, but it's totally true. Like, um, what is it? Trust fall, trust exercise. What is that? There's a really beautiful book that I'm totally forgetting the name of that very much does that type of thing. Um, and my, my friend who's a writer, Piper Weiss, um, I remember her telling me about the book and just saying, Oh, I didn't know you could do that. And like that kind of, way that it it busts your mind open when you break a rule that has been there and that you haven't really thought about breaking um mm -hmm. so yeah i like all that stuff i just also think that like you know we there is so much content out there and it's a way of of keeping expression interesting and and innovative right have you i'm, I'm curious kind of related to that have you ever felt yourself either consciously or unconsciously pushing the story in one way one direction or another either through sort of obviously documentarians have a point of view and, and they have a story that they're trying to tell but have you felt like more i guess on like that that sort of fine ethical line about um when you work with some of your subjects if you're pushing it in one direction or another? I mean, the ethics of this stuff is definitely something that I think about a lot. And, you know, I think about from a very um, like non-clinical approach, which is that, you know, there are, there aren't like a set of parameters that documentarians live by the way that doctors or psychologists, you know, and so these are, for us, they have to be very like intrinsic and, and humanistic and, and intuitive. Um, but I, I definitely also think about breaking, breaking rules so as to be more honest, you know, so like the idea that, um, by, uh, I'm trying to think if I can think of a good example that, you know, sometimes you, um, work with material in a way that, I mean, this is all of, so much of filmmaking is like, you work with material in a way to, you might put things slightly out of sequence, but because they speak to kind of a greater truth about someone's real right. tr um, 
pro, uh, like processor or right, like or something that could get them. lost unless the audience is really studying like in fine detail the the sequence of events. Whereas the larger point that you're making is like a critical one that you want to get across. Yes, yes. And so yeah, and then you know I have a project coming up that I can't really talk about yet just because some things aren't totally there yet but like you know so much of of what I'm really thinking about is is how to continue to think about breaking those rules and 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 looking at what we like know versus what we don't know and and where those like trying to lean into um the dark corner sometimes and so all of that is stuff that I get very inspired by when I see another people's work. Um, yeah. Very cool. Well, we can't wait to see what you do next, Jessica. And it's been a real pleasure uh, to have this time with you. Um, are there are there any last minute questions that, that may have come in that we want to get to, Megan? You guys did such a great job. The conversation was so informative <laughs> and and flowing. I think you know we're getting a lot of great comments, and everyone's loving your work, Jessica, and how honest you are. So thank you for that. Oh, thanks. Well, thanks for having me. It's it's great to talk to you. You bet. Anytime, and and hopefully you know more in the future. So thanks everyone for joining us uh, out there on the live stream, and stay tuned for the next. Uh, Creative Forces event. Um, we'll, be, we'll be doing more of these. Uh, and thanks, everyone. Stay safe. Jessica, thanks again. Take care. And we'll see you next time. Okay. Nice to talk to you. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.